Thank you for the opportunity to speak with you today here in Wellington. For the next few minutes, I'm going to be talking about the efforts of the Documenting the Now project to build a community of practice around social media archiving. For Lave and Wenger, a community of practice is a way of understanding how groups of people learn by sharing skills and tools in relationship with each other and in their daily lived experiences. I think the best of what IAPC has to offer is as a community of practice. But before I um, tell you about documenting it now, I need to do a little bit of framing. Please forgive me if this seems redundant or obvious. I've been interested in web archiving for some years, but this is my first time here at the Web Archiving Conference. So a significant part of our work in documenting it now has been appreciating and coming to terms with the scale of the web. As you know, the work of archiving social media is intrinsically bound up with archiving the web. But archiving the web is a project whose scale is paradoxically much bigger and much smaller, much, much smaller than the IAPC and its member institutions. So I said it truly is a privilege to be here, and I really meant it. Um, according to the carbon footprint calculator, my return trip from Washington, D.C. amounts to 2.19 metric tons of carbon dioxide. To put this in perspective, the Environmental Defense Fund estimates that the average American car emits about 7 tons of carbon dioxide a year. So my trip was almost half of a year's operation of a car. So how many cars do you think our conference amounts to? Hopefully you'll see why this is important in a moment. So maybe you saw this uh, story in The Guardian um, a few months, I think it was about a month or two ago, about the projected energy consumption of the internet. According to the piece, researchers estimate that by 2020, running the internet will generate 3.5% of all global emissions, which will exceed that of the entire aviation and shipping industries. That's only a year away. By 2025, the internet and all its connected devices could use up to 20% of the world's electricity. And by 2040, internet carbon emissions will be up to 14%, which is roughly the same amount as the entire United States today. Even if 100% of future data centers use renewable energy sources, the additional demand for electricity would significantly eat into any savings that would have been made in overall energy use. So one of the researchers is quoted as saying, we have a tsunami of data approaching. Everything which can be digitalized is being digitalized. It is a perfect storm. Arguably, the storm is here already. As the article goes on to point out, it's the cost of keeping increasing amounts of data online ready to be streamed that accounts for these observed and forecasted increases. Now, just as a thought experiment, try to imagine archiving all of this data. Imagine some new archiving technology that made it possible to archive it all. Perhaps it's some new decentralized digital vellum that's orchestrated with smart, contrast, smart contracts and runs on cryptocurrency. I'm joking, of course, but what impact would archiving all this data have on our environment and on our planet to say nothing of our budgets. This is not to say we don't need better tech for web archiving. We do, but better web archiving technology won't save us. We need to be able to think and talk about what we are saving and why, because we can't archive it all. In fact, we must not archive it all because that would be seriously jeopardizing our ability to survive. So the Internet Archive's mission is to archive the web and to ar provide universal access to all knowledge. How much of the web is in the Internet Archive? Of course, it's hard, if not impossible, to say, but let's not let that stop us. In 2016, Google announced that it had 130 trillion URLs in its index. In a blog post also written in 2016, the Internet Archive shared that they had saved 510 billion web captures. So we could estimate that in 2016, the world's largest public archive of web content had collected 0.39% of the web. What 0.39% of the web do you think they archived? Of course, 
this is mixing apples and oranges because on the one hand we are talking about web captures and on the other we're talking about URLs. But comparing distinct URLs in the Internet Archive would only make this percentage smaller. Even worse, Google themselves don't really know how big the web is. They just know how many distinct URLs their bots have wandered into. But this low percentage probably doesn't come as any surprise to the archivists in the room, who know that between 1 and 5% of all institutional records will survive in archives, as archives. As uh, Vern Harris would perhaps say, the Wayback Machine and all our web archives will always be a sliver of a sliver of a sliver of a window into process. This is why they're so important to us. We need to decide what to collect. How we decide is what's important. We need to talk about how we decided. And this is exactly what you do here at IAPC. Okay, so the web is a lot bigger than us and trying to archive it all might kill us all if we were able to do it. Uh, but how is web archiving smaller than the IAP IAPC and its member institutions? In, uh, in August 2014, let me just start this, hold on a second. Um, in August 2014, my friend and collaborator Burgess Tools and I sat in a bar with a small group of friends at the Society of American Archivists meeting in Washington, D.C. We were talking about what it would take to collect the tweets about the protests in Ferguson, Missouri. They were happening as we spoke. These protests were in direct response to the murder of African-American teenager Mike Brown by police officer Darren Wilson. We were thinking about Zainab Tufekci's uh, piece that had just come out, What Happens in Ferguson Affects Ferguson. Um, it's actually What Happens in Hashtag Ferguson Affects Ferguson, uh, which was about the disparity in what she was seeing in Facebook versus Twitter. We weren't exactly sure what the right way to do this data collection was, but we did know why we wanted to do it. We knew that Ferguson was a significant political and cultural moment, that scholars would someday want to study. And forget about the future, we knew researchers would want to study it right now. So we used a, a nascent utility called Twark to collect 13 million tweets that contained the word Ferguson from August 9 through August 27, 2014. We started writing in a blog about how we were doing this work and how to use the tweet metadata that had been assembled. We continued doing data collection around the protests of Walter Scott, Freddie Gray, Sandra Bland, Samuel Dubose, Alton Sterling, Philando Castile, Corin Gaines, and the Black Lives Matter movement that catalyzed heightened awareness about police violence against people of color and structural racism. We were emboldened to hear that others wanted to help out and to do this work too. For years, oh, so, sorry, four years and a Mellon grant later, we've had the opportunity to work together as a team to improve the, that Twork utility we started with in 2014 and to create a few more tools along the way to help in doing some of this work. These probably don't seem like your typical web archiving tools, but I'd like you to think about why that is. So let me stop this here and go to the next slide. So the, the first uh, tool here is, is Twark, which I mentioned already. Um, it is a command line tool for collecting tweets from Twitter search and uh, streaming APIs. Uh, it can also collect threaded conversations and user profile information, among other things. It also comes with a kitchen sink of utilities that have been contributed by uh, members of the community. So, uh, tools like um, creating a network graph out of the tweets or um, hashtag counts, that kind of thing. Uh, the second uh, app, uh, tool that we created is uh, something called the Catalog. Um, we, the Catalog is a, a clearinghouse of Twitter identifier data sets that live in institutional repositories around the web. These have been collected by uh, folks like the University of North Texas, George Washington University, UC Riverside, the University of Maryland, York University, the Society of Catalan Archivists, 
University of Virginia, University of Puerto Rico, North Carolina State University, University of Alberta, Library Archives Canada, and more. Um, the, the next uh, utility here is called the Hydrator, which is a desktop tool um, for turning tweet identifier data sets from the catalog back into structured JSON and uh, CSV for analysis. It was designed to be able to run for weeks on your laptop to slowly reassemble a tweet data set while respecting Twitter's terms of service and also users' right to be forgotten. The next tool is something called Unshorten. Um, sorry, the screenshot isn't really the greatest uh, except for the nerds out there. Um, but uh, Unshorten is a microservice that makes it possible to bulk normalize and extract metadata from a large number of URLs. Diff Engine is a utility that tracks changes on a website using an RSS feed and uh, publishes those changes to Twitter and Mastodon. This is an example here of the um, White House Diff account, which uh, announces changes to executive orders made on the White House blog. And finally, um, we have an application still in development called DocNow, which uh, allows archivists to observe Twitter activity, do data collection, analyze reference web content, and optionally send it off to the Internet Archive to be uh, archived. These tools emerged as part of doing the work of, um, of, of social media archiving. Rather than building one tool that attempts to solve some of the many problems of archiving social media, we wanted to create small tools that fit particular problems and could be composed into other people's projects and workflows. We wanted to thoughtfully intervene into a scholarly communications landscape where researchers were using social media data, but not always sharing their methods and their data sources. So the truth be told, these tools are actually just a sideshow for what we've really been trying to do in the project. Over the past four years, we've been able to work with an emerging community of archivists, researchers, and activists who already see the value of social media and web archiving, but are interested in developing practices that speak to the ethical concerns that arise when doing this work. Documenting the now is a distributed team with porous boundaries, so having an open Slack channel was useful for coordinating. But the work largely happened in several face-to-face -face meetings in St. Louis and Ferguson, Missouri, where we heard from activists about how they wanted their social justice work to be remembered. This was only made possible, <clears throat> possible excuse me, by facilitating direct conversations between archivists, technologists, researchers, and activists about how to remember the protests. These conversations also took place at the Ethics and Archiving the Web conference that was hosted by Rhizome uh, earlier this year. Drawing on our reading of existing guidelines from the Society of American Archivists and the International Association of Internet Researchers, we developed a set of recommendations described in a white paper that we um, we've come to informally refer to on the team as uh, the Ferguson Principles. We can discuss in more detail during the Q&A or during our workshop on Friday um, how these, uh, these principles work, um, but I thought I'd just introduce them pretty quickly here. Um, there's four of them. The, the first one um, is that uh, archivists must engage and work with the communities they wish to document on the web. Archives are often powerful institutions attention to the, position, to the positionality of the archive vis-a-vis -vis content creators, particularly in the case of protest, is a primary consideration that can guide efforts at preservation and access. Uh, the second is that documentation efforts must go beyond what can be collected without permission from the web and social media. Social media collected with the consent of content creators can form a part of richer documentation efforts that include the collection of oral histories, photographs, correspondence, and more. Simply telling the story of what happens in social media is not enough, but it can be a useful start. The third is that archivists should follow social media platforms' terms of service only where they are congruent with the values of the communities that they are working with. What is legal is not always ethical, and what is ethical is not always legal. 
context, agency, and again, positionality matter. And fourth, when possible, archivists should apply traditional archival practices such as appraisal, collection development, and donor relations to social media and web materials. It is hard work adapting these concepts to the collection of social media content, but they matter now more than ever. These aren't meant to be global principles to be applied in every situation where you are archiving social media, <clears throat> but they are meant to be touchstones for conversations to have particularly when you are doing web archiving work in the context of social justice. So we recently announced a new round of funding to continue this work, which you can read more about in the post um, on our blog about uh, phase two. But in a nutshell, this funding will allow us to do two, uh, three interrelated things. The first is to, um, to continue to develop and sustain the tools that we've worked on so far. And if you'd like to be part of the, these uh, tech conversations, we'll be opening up our development calls shortly. Um, we'll also be developing a series of workshops to help build digital community-based archives in direct partnership with social justice activist organizations. So look for information about how to apply to be part of this in the new year. And thirdly, we will be working with a new project partner, Meredith Clark at the University of Virginia to help uh, or to develop an openly licensed college level curriculum that gives students meaningful experience with and frameworks for the ethical use of social media in their research. So returning to where we started, I've been excited to see the IIPC developing its own virtual community in Slack and that there are efforts such as the online hours supporting open source and the uh, training working group that allow engagement to grow outside of the select few who are able to attend these yearly face-to-face -face meetings. Since I don't work at an IAPC member institution, I'm not totally up on the latest uh, efforts that are going on, but I do think there may be opportunities for the IAPC to adopt some approaches to web archiving tools and practice that get outside of the institutional walls we so often find ourselves operating in. I'm specifically thinking of the decades of work by the, uh, the so-called Australian School on the Records Continuum model, which was developed by Sue McCamish, Frank Upward, and, uh, and others. The Records Continuum model takes an expansive and an integrative view of what counts as records and the context in which they can be produced. Also, strategies drawing on community archiving where records continue to live in the environments that they were produced in could be very generative for moving efforts in this direction. Here I'm thinking of the work of uh, Flynn, Punzalan, uh, Caswell, C4. But what if we also thought of web archiving work as getting out into the world to help people sustain their websites rather than taking their websites and putting them in, in an archive. This is what Niels Brueger calls uh, reborn digital content, content that's born digital and then reborn in another place. So if any of this sounds useful and interesting to you, please get in touch with me um, or Burgess. Uh, Burgess, I think, will be around um, at the NDF uh, National Digital Forum next week and I, you'll probably see him around here as well. Um, and uh, we are gonna be hosting a workshop on a Friday too, so you're welcome to, to join us there if this sounds interesting. Um, and uh, finally, please consider joining our Slack channel and you can find uh, our blog and our Slack channel, um, mailing list, things like that, uh, and, and the links to the tools as well uh, on this website here. So uh, thank you.